So uh, I'm really delighted to be here. We've been working with um, Zorana and with Digestive Cancers Europe for the past few years. Uh, we've been awarded an Accelerator Cancer Research UK grant and award. And uh, we have engaged uh, Zorana and her team since the beginning and the exception, actually, even in the right and faith. And now uh, I know that Zorana has been kind enough to let us have um, uh, Nicola Valeri, who is part of the team, presenting uh, a few months ago, and also Gabriele Dubini as a part of the initiative. And now I'm going to get into the third part of the grant and the award that is a little bit more technical, but I hope that we'll be able to, to somehow explain it to you in sufficient details. But please do not hesitate to stop me or actually to ask as many questions as you want. And the, the, what I'm going to present has to do with the single cell genomics. So basically genomics in one side and single cell. And we are trying quite strongly actually to move uh, this new technology into the clinic to, to the patient benefits. So uh, there are two key contexts that I would like to, to pass through and to deliver. Uh, the first one is that DNA is not enough. We actually, as a geneticist as well, we tend to be a little bit obsessed about the DNA. I will try to make the point that uh, knowing the DNA sequence, uh, even for a patient uh, treatment and cure, is really not enough anymore. And the second thing is uh, to forget the bulk, but I will explain it a bit better uh, later on. As, as you may realize, these two persons here are Watson and Quick, the people that discovered the structure of the DNA in 1953. And so why DNA is not enough? So this is the major tenet of uh, life, you can say, of molecular biology more specifically. So we have a DNA, and the DNA then is translated like a book into RNA, and the RNA then gets rise to the protein. This is really the centerpiece of, of, of everything. And uh, the thing that is really emerging more and more clearly is that uh, the DNA actually is organized, is packed in a very complex way. And the fact that this path has a huge consequences on its function in the, its activity. So this is the DNA helix, as you can see, the DNA is packed into basically the nucleosomes, and then even more into chromatin assembly, and then finally into chromosomes. So what is important is that if you look at an organism, like for example, a zebra in this case, but that of course true also for humans, that all the cells in our body has exactly the same DNA sequence. So the question is, how come that you have so many different tissues, so many different organs that look so different if the DNA is basically the same in all cells? And actually, in a little bit simplistic way, but we can actually certainly say that the difference between the organs is driven by the way by which the DNA is packaged. So in one organ, the DNA will be packaged in a certain way, and in another organ, the DNA will be packaged in another completely different way. So it's the packaging in many ways that makes an organ different from one to the other. And the consequence of this is that the way by which you package the DNA would have major implication on how the RNA is organized and expressed, and finally the protein that really make the bulk of the cell. So that means that the, depending on the tissue, you may have different uh, portion of the DNA that is expressed, and ultimately that will be driving the differences among behavior of the organs. And I would like to make the point that, that more and more is becoming clear that also in cancer this is important. So the DNA sequence is crucial, certainly, but also how the DNA is packed as a major implication on cancer biology. And this is, um, and this is basically what I was just mentioning now. The second concept that I would like to, to transmit is that to forget the body. So when we talk about genomics, genetics, even in patients, when we say this patient uh, sadly does have a mutation in cancer on this specific oncogene or tumor suppressor, we rarely, if ever, look at a single cell of the tumor. We tend to take, to take a bulk or so a group of cells, we analyze them, and we say, on average, we do have these changes, these modifications. 
In reality, uh, recent technologies, the uh, so-called single cell technology, has really shown how we can uh, somehow fragment the tumor, for example, a tissue in single cell and analyze the genomics of the single cell. And this is the, really the new era of single cell genomics. I should say that, and I don't have time and room here to really go into many details on this, but that single cell genomic is really revolutionizing the whole field of biology, but also potentially of the clinic. So being able to look at the single cell, how the DNA, RNA is altered, and not simply looking at the bulk at the average cells, it's really changing, uh, I would say, forever, our understanding of the tumor and also hopefully the way by which we treat it and, and cure it. If you look at this tissue here, for example, before we just simply, this is a, a, an eye, a, a clearly a cartoon, you see that the eye here. And what we have been doing up to five or six years ago was simply to take all the cells match them, and then look at what was, uh, uh, what, what, what was the genomic inside it. But of course, we will not be able to see the difference among the different cells inside. What we can do now with the single cell genomics is really to have a complete picture of, the, in this case, the RNA at the, each single cell level. So each of these little dots that you can see here, each of them represent one single cell on which we have collapsed all the RNA data just to really show what is important in each single aspect. So through this collaboration, on which also um, Digestive Cancer Europe is, has been engaged, we have a, a collaboration uh, um, involving uh, several institutes in Italy, but also in the UK, in the ICR, the Bass Cancer Institute, Norwich, as well as the University of Cambridge, and also a group in Israel. And the idea would be really to bring this single cell genomic uh, technology to the, to the clinic. So what we've been doing is that uh, focusing on the, basically on not, not anymore of the bulk, but really on the single cell, and try to devise methods to really find that not only the sequence of the DNA, but also how the DNA is packed and organized at the single cell level. And I will say that we've been successful on this. I mean, we have uh, built this epigenome, and I can show you here the comparison between single cell on the same tumor, on the left, looking at the genetic landscape of the tumor. These are uh, colon cancer uh, patient cells that have been uh, uh, injected in mice and then grow for several generations. Then with the collaboration uh, in uh, Torino Candiolo here in Italy, we have obtained these cells and compared the profiles of the genomic DNA, pure DNA on the left with the brown and orange colors, and instead with the teal colors on the right with the epigenome information. I'm not going to go into details, but I think you can appreciate that while the genetic DNA profile are fairly straightforward, showing, for example, in this case, basically the presence only of two clones, the epigenome, epigenome, epigenetic landscape is much more diverse, is much more complex, suggesting that indeed the epigenetic of the cancer is really a driving force, very important for understanding the tumor, and also, as uh, uh, we will see, also in driving new therapies. Uh, another aspect that we've been exploited is uh, the so-called RNA velocity. RNA velocity is a technique that exploiting, again, single cell data on RNA can provide also the direction of the cell. So somehow it tells you which is the destiny of which cell, what is going and what, what, what is directed to. But what we've been doing with this grant is really showing that it's not only the RNA that can provide this information, but also the epigenetic. Here we took uh, iPS cells, basically cells obtained from a, a normal cell from the skin of an individual. We went back and we generated some stem cells out of it, and then we witnessed how these cells differentiate into neural cells. And you can see that also the chromatin somehow underscores and undergoes certain accelerations, like in this case, and it does have in general a clear direction toward the more mature neural cells here. And we are applying this technique also to uh, tumors 
and more specifically to this uh, uh, crucial and medical need that we are trying to tackle with this grant. And this one is the first, the first one is that uh, decide beforehand whether a therapeutic regimen will be effective in a specific patient. Unfortunately, what we do now, we do when we have a patient coming into the clinic, we give whatever uh, therapy is the standard care for that kind of disease for that kind of patient. We are trying to modify the pattern so we to be able to really decide before giving to a patient the therapy using some of the technology that I just uh, showed you before, whether a, a, the, the defined drug will be effective for the specific tumor cells of this patient. So we can spare the patient the pain and the toxicity of uh, unaffected drugs, and we can really try to be more precise and personalized in the treatment of this cancer. Second, uh, while the patient is awfully treated and cured, we keep his cells or her cells and we grow them in the lab and see which are the mechanisms of resistance that may develop. So at the end, if and unfortunately when the uh, resistance to the therapy may come back, we will know in advance which are the therapies that are most appropriate for treating this cancer that just came back. Because we already built in the model in the lab, so we'll be ready to tackle it in the case and I think that due to time constraint, I'm pretty much done. I would like to thank the team, Francesca, Diana, Martina, David, and Valentina, and also the several collaborators that we have in Italy and throughout the world. And thank you very, very much again for your.